that the team was completely about, but he's one of those who can actually pick up mud and construct a wall and make it so uh, So, he will be speaking about uh, alternative building technologies from a vernacular perspective. Just have to share this information with you that uh, this session, uh, myself and my friend Subhash Basu will be sharing our experiences basically and uh, just to brief uh, I'll be mainly talking about the alternative technologies what we have been working since three decades uh, it all started in uh, Indian Institute of Science the department called application of science and technology to rural areas where both of us were working under Professor Jagdish and uh, I will just talk about some of the technologies which we started working on and uh, Gramo Vidya is an NGO society uh, which we started about 26 years back with uh, Professor Jagdish and uh, friends of us who are working on these alternative ideas in universal science. Uh, basically we are trying to address issues which are related to building construction housing and trying to look for alternatives. We are definitely not trying to generalize any solution whatever we are trying to uh, share with you. I think it is so contextual and uh, the background for this is probably like uh, unless we uh, include artisans in any area wherever we are trying to construct uh, in such a way that we not only recognize their skill but see how we can upgrade that and each place can give us a solution which is more appropriate. So essentially we are looking at masonry buildings. So basically load bearing masonry buildings. As we were coming from Lucknow to Kanpur we saw very good quality burn bricks but still we found uh, reinforced concrete columns and reinforced concrete beams being used. So we need to question. Uh, why can't load bearing masonry buildings function properly? So we are trying to look at uh, alternatives in terms of stabilized mud blocks, stabilized rammed earth and stabilized adobe. When I uh, talk about stabilized uh, mud, basically we are trying to look at stabilizing soil with uh, a stabilizer. Uh, in addition to compaction in uh, stabilized mud blocks which means we are trying to use cement and lime and trying to stabilize the mud, press it in a manually operated press or a mechanized press and produce a block. It uh, uh, in a way avoids the necessity to burn it. Basically you have burn brick which is very commonly used. So we are trying to look at a method where we do not need to burn it. So we are trying to look at saving some energy, thermal energy which means embodied energy in a building will come down. The issue is uh, should we stabilize it or not? I think that is open. We can look at situations where we can use mud with organic stabilizers if that wisdom is available or even plain mud structures provided we can design it. So when we talk about strength of the material which is generally talked about is it strong enough? I am not getting into earthquake uh, situation. So we will not discuss that because I think enough information has been discussed in the previous uh, session. When we look at plain mud, we depend on the dry strength of the material. If we can keep the building in such a way that the issue of rainwater or the wetness will not pose a problem to the building. And if it has a good detailing of a good roof which takes away the water and even if in case of rain splashing on the external surface of the wall, if it erodes, all the eroded mud will fall below. If there is some kind of a maintenance, take the same raw material and put it back in a way that which was a practice usually. You know most of the festivals, Diwali probably there was a maintenance, lime wash or something used to happen. It was a part of our culture which we think is something called maintenance now and take it seriously. So if you want to do it with unstabilized mud it is possible 
But if you want to build thinner walls, when I talk about unstabilized mud, you end up thick, having walls which are thicker. If you want to bring down the thickness, then if you look at a 9 inch thick wall like you normally build with burn brick, it is possible to stabilize and build it. So, that is the small uh, manually operated uh, press used to make these blocks, you stack it and cure it. This is my own house built 26 years back, I still live there. This is a rammed earth technique wherein it is like a cast in situ. You, you can have a small mold or a big mold depending on how much you can invest. So, you can use that and in situ you manually ram it, you know and then you can build a two story or three story, you know one can design the number of stories, it is possible. We have been able to help people to build four story masonry buildings using these alternatives and you do not need any of these things, you can even have a small mold, uh, then you can have stabilized adobe, adobe you know it is a sun dried brick, you put the stabilizer in it and then go through the usual process of mixing, mold it and you can build it. This is a proposed three storied structure, two stories have already been done, exposed, no plastering both inside outside. So, one of the thing is there is lot of material consumption is plastering we can avoid that, okay. we do not need to plaster the buildings. Then uh, some of the roofing systems which we are trying to look at reviving them basically are unreinforced masonry walls and domes. It is possible to have a roof with brick masonry, you, know, you can have a brick masonry roof, no steel in it, you can build it, this is an example. Uh, in Mahabalipuram. A dome construction, you can build a dome, all that probably you need is uh, in a modern context when you go look for uh, thinner walls, we normally look at a ring beam, <coughs> this is an edge beam and a tie rod, then you have a ring beam here. This is a 32 feet diameter uh, dome construction, this is a 16 feet diameter vaulted roof. So, these are all the possible roofing examples one can look at using masonry. There are different alternatives also in terms of composite T beam roofs, you can have a precast panel and a beam, jackass roofing can be done. This is the Astra office in Indian, Indian Social Science campus, where we demonstrated uh, most of these uh, technologies. Uh, this is a uh, kind of a cast in situ, uh, kind of a jack arch, you can even have a flat panel. So, precast methods can also help us, you know in fact, if you want to cast an RC slab, you need to put the centering, then pour the concrete with all the steel required and then wait for it to set, then you remove it, then you you know plaster it after curing, so several stages. So, here precast system has that advantage. Utilization of industrial waste, this is another issue we are trying to address because uh, whether we like it or not, we have lot of factories which generate waste. This is one such case in Tamil Nadu, it is a foundry uh, factory, they produce black sand which is thrown, again landfills are an issue, they do not have land, it is a big problem for uh, disposing waste. So, we can recycle this waste, aluminum factories you have red mud, of course, fly ash somebody was talking about granite fines, milling granite, milling machines you have waste. I think we will have to look at waste whatever we are generating whether we like it or not, how best to utilize them. And of course, recycling the demolished uh, waste because I have been watching uh, Bangalore about 20, 25 years old building gets demolished and they look for some land to throw the debris it is not necessary, you know we can, it can go back to the building, if at all there is a reason to demolish it, it can be done. So, that is another direction which uh, is important, this is just an example of a basement ground floor plus first floor, there is one more floor whenever they want to build, they will, it will get. So, it is essentially a four storied, even in the basement uh, we have used mud blocks. So, it is possible to use this is another example of a single storied uh, with a courtyard house uh, what you were talking about, but it has windows on all external sites also. So, with this uh, I think uh, 
I will request Subhash Basu to continue uh, with uh, respect to its relevance uh, for today's symposium, what is it we are trying to look at? Yeah, this presentation I just prepared uh, only for this occasion. Uh, our group basically we are working, uh, we started with research but then gone into dissemination and then we realized that dissemination has a very important part which is the training. So we are mostly, this NGO is mostly devoting all our time to this. But in the process we uh, also look back and try to see what is happening, how we relate ourselves with the vernacular. So uh, that's how we thought that we'll uh, make a little turn and twist in our presentation and see whether it is making some sense for this occasion. <coughs> now uh, I'll just go through four or five slides to just to make my points what uh, actually we are talking, why we are talking about alternative and what uh, alternatives we are talking about. Uh, in one sense, you know, whatever shortfalls are there in the regular technology, we like to overcome that right, with any new technology, new ideas. And the sec other things that we need to address in the process is the energy crisis, environmental pollution, and the scarcity of resources. So a technology which tries to do this, it provides you to overcome the shortfall of the present mainstream technologies and tries to address some of those things. Not always, but that's the inner urge for developing the alternatives. Now, in this context, we like to see where we stand with the vernacular. Now, vernacular architecture also, uh, it has been uh, looked at by architects in a different way, engineers in another way, and most of the architect we fall in the trap of looking at the image and copying the image and call it vernacular which is a stylization of vernacular. But vernacular has an inner spirit and the spirit is a process. It's not a product, not what we see outside, but how that evolved and that is changing. So it is not necessary that I go back and look at an old house which is looking nice and try to copy that idea into a modern building. But try to understand in that context why that thing evolved and what was the good spirit behind that and can we borrow that spirit in the modern architecture and that is how we look at vernacular not looking at the old thing because in architecture we will find architects go happily goes to the historical context borrow the image try to bring that image into the elevation and other features or sometimes certain functional features like courtier or a veranda and try to incorporate that but uh, uh, we thought that we will try to look at vernacular from uh, a little different angle but there are people those have certainly looked at it we are not <laughs> something different from them uh, there are components in vernaculars uh, in vernacular when it evolves particularly one of the things in vernacular i like to say that it is something where we feel strongly that the user participates in the whole process of construction it's not somebody on behalf of the users are trying to ima imagine all these things and putting a little bit of mix with that. My ideas as an artist, always we have that ego and we try to incorporate that. But here in vernacular, that ego is missing. And it is the owner who participated in the whole process. If he makes mistakes, he knows that it's his own mistakes. He will not call the architect that you know, he has <laughs> manipulated and spoiled the building. So it is very important when I define, or rather our group defines the vernacular, we feel that we are actually involving the owner and the user. We try to tell them what are the uh, possibilities and problem and potential so that he can take the decision. And we actually try to help the owner to build. So that is the kind of process we are looking at, but invariably climate, culture and technology comes into the picture and uh, the context. Uh, the, it is changing from time to time. As the time progresses, also the context is changing and new issues are coming. So it is a reflex priority. Immediately have to react to it and try to solve the problem. So that is the kind of things we are looking at. If we come to contemporary scenario, here what is happening, technology and specialization, both institution and specialization. These two are very important things. Although, although I am talking in a big, big institutional campus, 
but it is the institution and the specialization which has actually manipulated with the vernacular. That's why you have lost all those things. So we have to question these things. We have to. We cannot forget the institutions are important, but the way institution works, this, the way specialization is working, the way we are making people totally delinked from the process of construction, is invariably creating a lot of problem which we have to address in a contemporary scenario. <coughs> now. In general, I just jot down few essence of the vernacular process. I said it is not an image, not a product, it is a process. In the process, uh, it is a process which is little unself-conscious. It is not so consciously taking decisions like engineers we take and architects we take the decision in a very conscious way. And there are lots of other inputs come in the process. Lack of pretensions and desire to impress. This is in modern architecture, particularly it is very much there that we have to impress others rather than to satisfy our real inner urge. Direct response to the way of life. Our way of life itself is a questionable thing now. We do not know which way we should really, uh, I mean, live. So there is all this confusion and chaotic situation actually get reflected in the architecture when we are looking at it. Participatory, this is another thing because of specialization, participation reduces. And lot of, uh, even the other day we were in Bangalore, somebody says, I am also doing alternatives. And then we asked what kind of alternative, he said he is doing some prefabricated uh, no, gypsum board construction. They also call themselves alternative. But there is no question of participation in a situation like this. It is a factory made product, it will be assembled by certain people. So there is no concept of vernacular there. But we like to see that participatory elements uh, become important. No rigid program or drawings. This is again architects and engineers do not like, but we like to experiment with it. We still work with a watershed. All my buildings still today, we work with a watershed. I do not have a CAD drawing and most of the things get changed thoroughly in the process of work. So that provides me a very flexible kind of program to work with. Then uh, <laughs> flexibility to change the space utilization, site specific, these are common things. And reverence to the local material and skill. This is where real vernacular essence comes. We should have reverence. We should have a respect for the local material and skill level. Quite often we say, oh, these are very primitive. We don't like to. But we have to upgrade that if it is. And we have to understand what is the level of skill. Quite often, and still now, today, we, every building for us is a training program. I'm just doing a building. I'll show you. you know, there's a vault to be built. And we have to work with the local skill. Somebody says, no, I haven't done this thing earlier. I don't know how to do. We cannot leave the place. And it is our role only to work with them and to upgrade the skill and ultimately get you the new kind of architecture. Enjoy a shared vocabulary with the community. Uh, this is again where modern architecture and the client, both. A client comes to us and says, look, I want a totally different kind of building. If he has a little exposure abroad and other, he comes there with a photograph and says, I want this kind of building. So there is no dialogue with the surrounding environment and culture. He likes to stand out. Everybody of us, we like to stand out. We like to have a different building. So this is where we lose our kind of identity with the community. Our building is something good and great, but there is no continuity with the local environment. And that does not really satisfy the basic of vernacular. <coughs> so that is where uh, we stand. Now, uh, I will say what happens. We all started. Yeah, please. Why do you think there needs to be continuity with the location or with the surrounding building? Why should I build in a similar distance? It is not similar, but as a dialogue. Like you are here, and if you talk in French, you can say, yeah, I know French, but others will not be able to react to you. So we are talking about a dialogue where we understand each other, sensitivity in the terms of understanding. So that is the only thing, because like, architecture is also a language. And if we use a different book, vernacular, the word used more often to the language instead of uh, building and other things. So I am looking at that kind of things co correlation with the language. <coughs> now, uh, in Astra, in Indian Institute of Science, we all started working. Interestingly, this is the mud best work. It did not start in an institutional world, how things start is that the idea came from abroad. The pressing of mud, the idea, one of our professor, Professor Reddy, he brought this idea and said, look, uh, 
uh, there is a hand operated press. So why not we try it out? It can work nicely in our context. So the basic idea is not coming from the vernacular. It's coming from outside. We realized that yes, this is the interesting things. Then Professor Jagdish started working. We joined. So the first part of it, uh, we worked with the idea of stabilization with cement. We didn't try organic stabilizers and other. We didn't know anything about what the villagers do. We were in a beautiful campus with beautiful trees like what here and uh, we were working on stabilization like cement we understand being an engineer and architect so it is cement and we started working machine is also something which will inspire the engineers to work with so there is a little bit of component of machine design so these two things started next dec dec decade what happened is that we realized yes we know how to do it we can build something for ourselves we did our own building Astra office building we designed, Karnataka State Council building we designed, Central School in the campus we designed, all this thing but within the campus. For us the context was still uh, very much kind of foreign island kind of concept because these are island of prosperity. In you know if you are in the campus you don't know what happened. For us yesterday to search for a cup of tea we had to go out to really get a feel of what is outside world how much dust, how much pollution, what is the culture. So it's like that we are, we are working. Then for us, contextualization is a very important thing. So the moment we go out to our outside to, to search for the clients and convince others, then you realize what are the problems, what are the, their demands, what they expect. So that is the process started in the next decade. Understanding and with that starts the local art, development of simpler press, upgrading science. Why local art? Even in Karnataka, if I go out one place, I'll get black soil, one place I'll get red soil, one place it's whitish, somewhere it is as I say elitic, somewhere I say no, it is kalinitic. So there will be so much of variation, a new science starts. You have to investigate before you cater to a larger number of people. Then you have a press. You have press, it goes to the field, there's a problem. Phone call comes, oh, this is not working, what to do? So, a Western thinker, particularly in Auroville, they went in other direction, Me mechanize the phrase, give a lo lot of interesting options, you know, different kinds of molds. For us, we realize that if there is a problem, we have to run. Can we not make the press a little more simpler so that you know, in terms of maintenance and other things, it become easier? So we stuck to a simpler version of the press which was available and try to upgrade that. So that is in terms of development of this press and upgradation of science. One of the major problem uh, which we faced in our buildings that after a few years they started developing fine cracks and things like that. So we had to investigate quite a lot that why this happens, how to upgrade it. So there is a whole range of things, how you design the mix, how you prepare the soil. So this is a science where actually one of my colleagues, he did his masters and then further he went on to do his PhD. But that is the things, background things that is happening. And <coughs> also the behavior of the masonry. This is another area where structural engineer can work. So how, what mortar to use, what kind of frogs should be there, what happens when there is a lateral load, what happens when there is a uh, straightforward loading. Next decades, we, we, we were intensely in the field, field demonstration, understanding, adaptation, and performance. So this is where we started building hundreds of buildings. There was problem. One of the major problems thrown us out, actually we were out of the job for a while because the housing board, board, Karnataka housing board project, there was a major problem, quite a few building developed uh, cracks and newspaper published a big article and accusing that it, technology was developed by the Indian Institute of Science Astra. Uh, the sponsors, they withdrawn the money immediately, we didn't have any job. We went to Hardcore, like, please we have to you know, have something, but they will not. Uh, I don't know, they will keep themselves a little away. So this is a very important situation where you know, the, when you're actually disseminating that idea, there will be problems and we have to take care of all those things, knowingly or unknowingly. In this case, initially we thought, yes, there is a big demonstration, but then we realized in a corrupt system of government where you, know, you have to, you cannot put, if I say 5% cement, ultimately the contractor will put 3% cement or even less. So there was a problem. So uh, it was not problem with the technology, but the way we interact with the society. So here society comes into picture. Vernacular has to be strengthened on that. No IITs can 
check care of this, you know, <laughs> corruption in the society. So we have to work on the, in an entirely different plane. So then performance, you have to observe the building working for at least 10 years, 5 years, 20 years. Like Yogananda's house today, it, is, it has crossed 25 years marks. And so we confidently can discuss with people showing buildings which has already performed. So it's very, very important. And we have to actually do a lot of uh, corrections to some building. If there are problems, we have to address that. We cannot withdraw ourselves and say, no, no, I have done it. It's enough. We have to take care if there is a leakage, if there is a crack, if there is anything, we have to assure the people, no, no, it is not a major problem and we'll be able to take care of it. So those are the things that happens. And this is where the dialogue with the vernacular begins. This is where we are more close to the vernacular process. We are getting into the people, talking to them, giving them idea, training, getting feedback from them, actually identifying the users, those who will be able to participate with us. So all this process is very much going. And this is, this is what we say that this process, we are trying to link it, uh, link ourselves. Because there is an intrinsic link here established between vernacular <laughs> and the alternative idea. Whatever alternative idea, it's not only for building. It has to be tested and moved like this. <clears throat> now, I'll finish it with a few examples. Now, if you'd like to know about uh, stabilization, what happened, how it evolved, it has a long history. In a short way, I'll just put it, the civilization arts, arts started in India uh, with a project in Karnal. Also, it happened in Bangalore. Karnal project was a very big project, which is uh, 4,000 4, houses are built with stabilized rammed earth. I happened to meet uh, Charles Correa once. I didn't know him even. He came and asked, why your ideas are not spreading? I said, we are not the first people. There are people who have built 4,000 buildings. And none of the architects look back to see why it failed, whether it is working or not. We don't have that habit of going back and trying to investigate. Now, these 4,000 houses, you can see their problems. I visited them in 1986. Uh, and we found quite a few buildings are performing, but there are quite a few buildings had problems, problems of the plastering falling off. They are, again, with 3% cement, and the surface uh, it was not adhering well. I mean, the plaster was falling off. It has been reported. As you can see, here is a page from uh, Indian Concrete Journal. Indian Concrete Journal has reported when it was constructed. It reported when there is problem. And it is reported when it has been repaired. But uh, engineering community, then we already away from the earth. We are already into the concrete. Our head is in that concrete. We never looked back to see what actually is happening. So we looked at that. And uh, this is one of the person, Dr. Upal. He was still uh, alive and he was working. I spent a lot of time with him. Uh, in Chandigarh, people usually go to see the great work of uh, an architectural things, masterpiece. But he took me to a, a small building where civilization was attempted again with tar, 5% tar, which was melted, cut back, and then. And that building was very much there. He was say, telling me that I am threatened. I don't know when the development pressure will remove this building. But this is a very important landmark building for the people those are working on stabilization. This building is from uh, Bangalore on Whitefield. This is where the first time an Indian uh, uh, naval architect who brought a machine from abroad, from South Africa, and he started building his own house. This is what Professor, uh, Professor Reddy saw. And he brought that machine to Indian Institute of Science, and we started this work. This was in the mid-70s uh, when I just joined architecture. I joined in the, the group in 1882. <coughs> now, uh, the areas, uh, what we have a larger area, but the area that we like to discuss a little is stabilized adobe, stabilized rammed earth, unreinforced masonry roofing, and revival of timber use. Now, this is, Yoganath has already said, but I just like to draw the relationship. Now, here you see this is what the mold is all about. And uh, what we do, mix lime and uh, cement and then mold it. In this case, you can see a school child is doing. Quite often, as a part of our endeavor, we involve the school children because they are the people who, once they get the little exposure, perhaps will be able to explore it in a far better way. And they enjoy doing it. The other day, we were working with our architecture students. And uh, they were not knowing anything, but they enjoyed working with the mud. And they started making. I think that's the only way we can push them to enter into this whole area. <clears throat> uh, 
Now, uh, this is where uh, I think there is a vernacular technological link because the people in India still, particularly in Karnataka, they use this technology for making unburnt adobes and they do construction with it. It is a living technology. It is not like, not in like the French man who is uh, doing something. There is no UK and France and Germany. There is no tradition now. But they are engineers and architects are doing this thing for what? Third world countries. They train our engineers and architect. But in this country, all these technologies are alive. What we need to do is to go to the villages, stand by them, learn these techniques and to upgrade it. Now, otherwise they will come and teach us after some time. So, this is how they make it. This is a documentation work done by the students of architecture for their final year project work. So, this is a documentation of showing that how they make it. And they were using a wooden mold, we have replaced it with a steel mold. They were using a mold with the both side open, we have actually put another bottom plate so that the compaction is better, better and release of it is better. So, our upgradation is not great, it is nominal, but it is still worth. Ramped up technique. Yes, I also started my career in Auroville and <laughs> Auroville is another place which has all this craziness and I thought it is uh, Aurovillians those who have developed the ram death because I didn't have uh, even explored India to that extent. I know uh, uh, Popo Sami, <laughs> I mean he did some work with the local villagers and then it didn't work but he wrote a nice book which was published and uh, people shared. We also tried it but it didn't work. After that, I happened to travel quite a lot in different parts of India and this is one of my students uh, work. So, what happened? He found even in the villages of Kerala in a high rainfall area, people use still a wooden form work like this and they are doing ram death. This surprised me. I was surprised when I saw this ram death in, in Rajasthan. Each family they have this pieces of wood and wooden rammer. They just come back from the field afternoon and they start doing one layers of their wall. This is a technology known to even in Himalayas. So, these are typical technology and this is nowhere just to, we do not need to feel very proud that it is very Indian. Chinese they know it. Uh, everywhere throughout the world, evolutions of the mud technology is same, more or less same pattern. Only thing we have to rediscover locally. We do not need to feel great about our own things. It is our own thing, no patenting, nothing. <coughs> so, this is from Rajasthan. You can see their mold, wooden locks. And today, if you have to purchase a, yeah, I mean, this kind of system from an organized system, if you go to uh, Auroville and others, I want a uh, rammed up system, it will cost you quite a lot. And this costs nothing to the people. <laughs> I mean, they have their own wooden thing, box and they can do it. We can help them to improve the situation a little. If we like to repeatedly use it, we can go for metal. But if we, uh, the other day, actually, we just uh, doing a project. Uh, we went back to the wooden uh, mold, it costed me 3000 rupees. I recycled old wood, I made the uh, mold box, which I am working now. <coughs> so, options are very much there if we work from the first principles. These are the, this is another two technology which is very common in mud. One is a cob, which is a thick mud walls everywhere in India, they know it. On the top, you have wetland daub. People use bamboo or whatever other metal material is there and then plaster it. See the kind of damages and these are 200 years old building, there are plenty of damages, but they are fairly comfortable with it because they know their thickness is quite high and on the top there is still the wooden mem timber members are there, so it is not going to fall on their head and they are continuing. But if they have little money, uh, like in UK, <laughs> all this kind of building would have been conserved by English heritage. <laughs> Paint it nicely and the tourists will come, take photographs. But this country, we have plenty and so nobody bothers about it. <coughs> but there are things which actually stands out in a great way is Vardha Shivagram ashram of uh, Gandhi. Gandhi when he came back in this ashram was a necessity. Actually, there are lots of other people, those who could have, I mean, built for, on his behalf. But what he says at that time, that I wanted material which is available in 5 kilometers radius from this place, you go and get it and build out of it, I have no problem. 
and Mirabin was actually in charge of the construction. And they went around, they could find bamboo, they could find uh, pot tiles, they could get mud. So solution was very simple, wetland of walls, timber frame and a tile roof. It's still there. And uh, lots of NGOs goes in there, they meet over there, discussions will take place. You can see from Assam how little dawn doves can also inspire, you know, sometimes we say, oh, there is nothing much we can innovate. You know, even you can uh, do a nice sliding window with uh, wetland and dob, with the bamboo. The plenty of options are open. It's only that we have restricted ourselves from doing and looking at things. Now here is a ad stabilized adobe example. Now why I'm giving this example, this is in a remote place. Again, I stay in a place called Hassan, which is 200 kilometers from Bangalore. And this is another uh, 60 kilometers from Hassan in a remote place. And what you see in the back, that house is done with a hand mold, I mean pure uh, earth adobe. Now when I went there, his aspiration is he likes to have a RCC roof. He likes to have something modern. And what you see there in that house is his house, blue colors, and all this thing is their perception. It's not my architectural work. You can see architect would have been composed everything. And now it is like any other common man's house. That is their perception. I cannot manipulate with it. So what we did, we only suggested that how you can improve the situation in terms of making little bit of putting little cement to make it stable. And you can eliminate there also, it is not plastered. If you go close, it will be unplastered. We have used a filler slab made with the same kind of things. And you can see the children, children at home, the whole family participated in making all the blocks. And today, his neighbor wants some more blocks, and he has taken that, uh, this thing work that I will supply you this. So it's a business option opens out. So this is the kind of mode that we are working. And you can find this is possible if you have time. If I have an office in Bangalore, then I can, cannot do it. This is uh, Yogananda showed that two-story building. Uh, he is one for a person who actually pioneered to take these things. Because all the time it happens that when we have to talk about it, before we experiment it on others, we try to see that you know somebody uh, who is convinced about it can take the risk. So he has taken the risk to build this uh, house also. Uh, although it was, we worked on the technical part of it. We have plenty of graphs and charts and things like that. I can load it with all these things. But we are not showing you all these things because it is not a paper presentation. So after all this thing, it was hidden and dormant. After nearly five or 10 years, we took a decision that, yes, this has to be uh, popularized. So this building came up. <coughs> and after that, we have done more than 10, 20 houses. Now that's a rammed up mold, wooden molds, around 3,000 rupees mold. Uh, you can see another uh, ramp, I mean, adobe house which I'm doing in Hassan uh, for a Dolit uh, leader. And uh, he also accepted and participated. He, he, he has himself made a lot of these blocks uh, with the workers. And you can see the detailings here uh, evolved more at the site. You know, sometimes you feel, yes, I can save a little bit of steel if I can just do a little arch. That's fine. But there is no tension of architecture to compose all those things. <coughs> Now, this is another interesting area that we, we feel that you know, we can work, is cement and lime stabilization in one side. But if we can look at organic stabilizer uh, with soil, that will be another very interesting area. And it varies from place to place. So one of my students, he was working in, in Kerala. He found pond creepers. There is a particular kind of creepers. The juice are extracted and the villagers are using. Then we have terminalia chebula. This is, uh, uh, in Hartuki in, in Hindi or uh, Sanskrit you call it. And then you have jaggery, so is jaggery solution. We have termite mounds, so uh, things. So there are lots of this kind of thing that is a soap nut and that's uh, the uh, terminal achebula. So all these things can give you some kind of decoctions or juice and things like that. And the villages, they always use them to make it partially, improve, partial improvement. It's not like you, know, you get a great strength or anything like that. But you know, it can withstand water for a longer time. Suppose there is a flood, you know, one building collapses in five minutes, whereas this will take half an hour, 45 minutes, slowly it will absorb water. So basically, the improvements are not so drastic and dramatic, but all this thing works in a very beautiful way. And it is, the, it is our duty to rediscover all these little, little things. 
Now, it is not necessary that we give all these things, you know, a multinational can make a nice bottle out of it, 5 percent solution, you put it and they can sell it in the market. But what we need to do, work locally, strengthen this idea, so it will be part of their own understanding and knowledge. So, that is something what we are doing, we are devised simple tests which villagers will be able to do, give them those testing met methodology, so that they, they know that how much to add uh, and uh, what to add. Uh, quickly, we'll go through uh, roofing techniques. Again, when we disseminate this idea, uh, this is this work of building uh, domes and vaults. It started with Yogananda's uh, uh, PhD program, where he was doing the unreinforced uh, vaulted structure. I was doing a little work for him to kind of uh, going around to to find out the examples, historical examples or the vernacular examples, because we had to relate it. So. Uh, this is after we finished the work and uh, we did a small school, this is 40,000 rupees work for a very small school of uh, 10, 10 by 10, 3 rooms and here also children's they all participated and we did a burn brick in this case because we, it was not available stabilized mud block but the idea was to build dooms and vaults. So, we did this work uh, there. Now, I will show you our relationship <laughs> because I come from Bengal and you know going back to Bengal and looking at some of these things is very interesting at that time just went around. The, you see that house which is inspired by the thatch, Bengal thatch and this is inspired even the Mughal architecture. The lots of this architecture with the curved linear ends comes from this particular building. But the if you go inside, it is actually unreinforced vaulted roof. So, that is the thing, so, even the temple in Vishnupur which is all out of uh, bricks, they are all basically using unreinforced vaulted roof. Their thickness were high. Then you have a very interesting example when we went to Andaman. Andaman is a place where again lots of modern architect works, but what they brought there is a glass and steel. But Andaman's architecture by the Britishers, there was a very interesting thing. See, they all used burnt brick. And those buildings survived basically, basically because although it is a hot humid area, rusting is a major problem, but there was no steel. And one of the best example is the, the cellular gel, they are all vaulted roof. We go there for other things, but for us we always have to tend to look at the structure and then we realize this is all vaulted roof. And you see what happened there, the domestic buildings were also influenced by what Britishers were doing. This is also a characteristic of vernacular. It looks at what is happening around, try to understand it and trying to assimilate it to make it part of it. We do not need to be afraid whether it is the French or the German or who has introduced that idea. But if you can adopt that idea for a local context, then vernacular is working. So, you find again plenty of buildings. Yes? Do you use uh, rectangular bricks or trapezoidal bricks? No, no, we use regular bricks, whichever is available. No uh, special. Uh, specialized form of bricks. So, why would they? Uh, even the British use the same bricks, even the hardware also. Uh, Sir, uh, Danilo was talking about the wells. Yeah, yeah. Right? So, the wells could actually collapse inwards. Now, this, what happened, uh, actually, the motor joint will be little like this. And it has nearly touched the bottom part of it and it works. So, if you have to do large number of domestic buildings, see, this flexibility was there earlier, but today it is not there, but we can still manage. <coughs> we should not make it a constant for the technology. Again, there are very interesting, one of the things that people will say, oh, if you do a domes or vaults, you cannot build on the top. Because whether we do it or not, we all think, you know, any questions comes, can we do a multi-story? Ultimately, we have to build so much multi-story, but is it necessary? We can also change the concept of actual urbanization. This is also an issue that we have to address. Urbanization is not always, you know, building multi stories and try to solve problems. There are lots of small towns and others, we can solve problems for them first. So, there are situations where vault can be made nearly flat. And again, this example is very much there. If any of you from uh, Lucknow, Lucknow again is full of this kind of things. But very rarely we get into Bulbulaya and forget about uh, looking at the structures. But plenty of structures, whether it is in Delhi, whether it is Lucknow, whether it is Beng this is a from Bengal, from Gaur and Pandua. We uh, even looked at the architecture in south, plenty of examples are there, Vijayanagara period architecture, full of this kind of things. So, the moment the steel and concrete came, we started forgetting all those things. 
Now there is a big gap, a void we have created where there is no skill, no understanding. Today if I have to do these things, most of the mason will say, no sir, it will collapse. I will not do it. So uh, here is an example of nearly flat uh, roof. So uh, and domestic buildings, you see the, the, the in Tanjavur area, there are buildings with vaulted roof. These are domestic architecture, not great building. You'll find also even in temples. Don't say that a you know, temple doesn't go for arch. There are temples with arches. So <coughs> uh, that's a modern example. Uh, this, these are again small, uh, small, small order, uh, examples. And one of the things, as I said, that I, we started 30 years back and we used to do a small, small building. Even today we do it. We don't do any great buildings, but uh, good number of our buildings are small projects where architects don't like to touch. It will not work out for them because it is a small project. You have to spend more time at the site, more detailing, it doesn't work out. So there is a niche where we can work uh, in, a, in a small group uh, way. And then we realize that we need a lot more skilled people, those will be able to deliver this. They don't have a degree. They don't have to carry a big office staff. So this becomes an important uh, things for them. Yes. How much does that building cost? Uh, this has costed me some. This is around uh, uh, six. Uh, don't ask a direct question because it may not be relevant. Because it's, then we'll ask what is the local cost of building, what is the local labor cost, and all this. Because its relevance get lost until unless you look at that way. But most of our uh, buildings we compare with the local situation. If a local mason says that you know uh, your building will cost you so much. 1000 uh, rupees per square feet, then we try to see that at least 200 rupees per square feet is reduced in different means. This sometime will be more or less same as the RCC roof, but this uses local material, local skills. So that way, uh, you know, sometime if the cost also is very close by, still there is kind of thing, economy gets circulated within local people. The good thing about cost is that unless we break up the cost, and understand how much goes to the labor and how much for materials. I think understanding of cost itself is not uh, there. I think material is finite. We are this is uh, the bottom example is an important example for us. Very recently we completed. This is the Bangalore Sante. It is modeled more or less like the Delhi hut model. Actually, it is metro. Uh, Bangalore metro, they said that we wanted a craft bazaar. So we did uh, the whole stretch with all kinds of alternatives. We got a very good uh, IS officers who could back us, saying that you have freedom to do it. I have seen your work, and please go ahead and do it. Although the help from the other people was not so much, but we have somebody sitting on the top, agreed to the whole idea, gave us a tremendous freedom to work. So uh, we did vaulted roof, we did uh, all kinds of uh, technology that we know. And uh, people do go there. We involve the children also for the landscaping, planting trees, and other things. So the exposure input, all the architecture students, we arranged quite a few uh, program for them. And this is one thing that is you can see a training program. This is a training program is one thing that we do every year, at least three times or four times our own. A three days program where we invite architects, engineers, contractors, anybody, even farmers, lots of farmers and individual house owners. They said, yes, we like to know what are the options and we like to come and participate. Frustrated I, uh, IT people, this is another huge group. Those who get very well frustrated after working for some time, huge uh, this things, um, salary, but uh, nothing, no satisfaction, they also come. So uh, all these things, we have a nice group and uh, every time we spend uh, uh, hands-on training with them. And uh, not all of us, but quite often here and there we find somebody has picked up and doing something. And that's good enough. Uh, this is another area where we are working. Uh, so this is a pyramidal roof, and uh, one is a, just a simple uh, walls and domes, but we're doing also a pyramid and hand molded uh, adobes. We actually sampled the edge, and each time we cobbled it out. And what you see the wooden structure, it says non load, uh, I mean, it is not actually taking load, but to define the pyramid shape, we actually uh, got all these old timbers uh, and we fabricated that. This is the vault technique. The vaulting is done by quite a few architects, but they do the whole centering for the whole things. But what we do, we have a strip centering that you can see, and we slide it. So that's what, how we actually save the cost of making the, uh, the whole centering. 
removing the whole centering and also giving them confidence. The moment uh, they remove it, they know it will withstand. So that is something which is very important. Today, the masons have forgot to build arches. They all know they have to put two steel rods and then arrange the bricks on that. Without the steel, it will not stand. But the whole philosophy of arches, it's a compressive structure. You don't need steel. But we are already kind of perverted in such a way that steel has gone into it. And this has gone not on IIM. I will give you an example of IIM Ahmedabad. You, we all worship Louis Kahn for his great arches and all this. If you go and see, it has already undergone a repair because all the arches are cracking because they are reinforced. All the flat arches, they are rod inside. So even then, they, they were not confident enough to do it. And it is defying science. You don't need to have rod. Yes? Sir, exactly how much time it will take to stabilize that means you know, you can build it uh, in no time, I mean, depending on the number of workers working. Let's say half an hour you finish the one arch, then you can, there are two templates, one template remain, remain there, other template you bring it in the front. In a week's time, you can construct about uh, 12 feet length of Yeah, yeah, not a few more slides. Uh, just quickly go, go through the process that, you know, all our buildings, we do uh, initially one structure, we load it to failure. You can see there's a flat uh, dome we constructed there. We loaded it and then it loaded trap to failure to understand it. Then we go to uh, build something and even in the process we interact with the children and others. Here is a, is a school, uh, not a formal school. So the children came forward and said that we like to build a, a dome. And they did the dome. You can see there the Kashana school. It's in 1992. 1991, we actually uh, have already come out to the field to this. And this is the last work. Now, presently, I'm doing this vaulted roof. The same house which you can see in the bottom. This is the field condition. This is the work they have done in, uh, in two days. And we expect it to be over. Uh, more or less, it is over. I have just left uh, two days back. Perhaps in the evening, I can call up and find out. So that's the roof on the top, which is a vaulted roof. And both sides, uh, we have used pillar slab roof. <coughs> timber is one area uh, why we like to get in the timber is basically timber is one thing which is associated with all our vernacular now we say timber is not available we don't like to build but if you know how much timber we import huge amount of timber <laughs> it all comes and landed up in gujarat <laughs> uh, different ports of Gu gujarat all this and kerala and gujarat these are the huge entry point for the timber that is coming from Indonesia, coming from Africa. We deforest others. And we say we are protecting our forest. We grow, let us grow our own forest and use it. That's the only way we can survive. But this is a typical American attitude. No, you exploit things. It is colonial attitude, rather, you can say. And we are, you know, we are trying to be a mini colonial forces. So timber is one thing which is used extensively in our old buildings. We need to study it. And for that, what we are doing, all, you can see these stacked buildings. There are lots of buildings get demolished every year. And we are recycling all this old timber, door, windows, and other things. So that's one of the major areas. In actually, Metro Project, we use plenty of them. And this is another uh, way of uh, actually recycling. This is also recycled wood. This is also a recycled window. And this is just to show you the modern building in the end that this is what ultimately the uh, results that you can get where you have used all the alternative technologies. And that's all. Sorry. <laughs> the delay. Thank you so much. Okay.